Thank you. So the home I stood in was an assault on the senses. The front room of the home was dark, and a blanket of cigarette smoke hung in the air, which helped to dull the odor of the trash. Through the haze in the room, a television flickered, and Drew Carey in his Price is Right showcase showdown with his new modern living room sets stood in sharp juxtaposition to the pizza boxes and bags of trash piled in each room. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement coming from a duct tape recliner. A woman in the chair looked blankly at me. I saw in her brown eyes a lost sadness. I explained that the man had shown me into their home, and I was looking for her son, who we'll call Sam. She waved her hand lethargically at me, as if to shoo a fly, and said, knock yourself out. As I rounded the corner, I caught sight of the bathroom with its broken down toilet buckets of water, and badly stained bathtub with several inches of brown water. I was starting to understand why Sam had never been potty trained. The next room was littered with trash. And underneath the old newspapers, Mountain Dew cans, and grease-stained paper plates was a flattened old mattress. Is this where Sam slept? This is why he was so tired and irritated all the time. Was he getting any sleep, let alone a good night's sleep? It was here that a dog came bounding through the room, barking at me. And rushing in behind the dog was Sam. He called off the dog, <laughs> thankfully, and I explained that I wanted to talk to him. As I spoke with him, a large grin broke across his face, and he interrupted me and said, you came here just for me? I have been working in education since 1998, spending time with many children from many different backgrounds and many experiences. And in that moment, I was just beginning to understand poverty in my community. I hope to explain to you today what it is that I learned from my visit to Sam's home, why I think poverty continues to exist in an economic superpower, and what you and I can do about it. My learning curve with poverty was slow. Oops. Ah, there we go. My learning curve with poverty was slow and began in August of 2000 when I was hired to teach second grade in Columbia. I taught in an American school for ultra-affluent Colombians and American dependents. I lived and worked in Bogota, a city of 10 million, where polo clubs and slums nestled together in the Andes. Many associate Colombia with a developing economy, civil war, and drug cartels. I associate Colombia with coming of age. I was in my early 20s with two years of teaching under my belt when a Continental Airlines 757 whipped me away from my suburban middle-class upbringings. And when the door of the jet opened after landing, the first thing that struck me was the raw and wet Andean weather, followed by the equally raw slums and cra that crawled up the fabled Andean mountains. I spent weekends with my students' families at country clubs, patronized nightclubs, and for a treat once in a while, went to the North American malls and had lunch at the Hard Rock Cafe. However, my apartment building was nestled up against a scrap metal shack that a family of five, a goat, a small cow, and their cart shared. The shack was smaller than my two-bedroom apartment. In Colombia, my eyes were open to poverty. Poverty in Colombia was easier to explain. Developing economy, unstable currency, and civil war. Why did poverty persist here? I returned to the United States wide awake and paid close attention to my students who came from impoverished backgrounds. I worked hard with these children, supplying them with food, shoes, and clothing. But looking back, it was not enough, and not the right kind of work. Necessary, but incomplete. One might think that the conversation with Sam could have occurred in a home in a village in Afghanistan where in 2008, 
I was deployed with Delta Company 2108 of the 27th Infantry Brigade of the New York Army National Guard, who will. Big jump from being a kindergarten classroom to a soldier in a combat zone. I served as an infantry soldier and had the opportunity to see much of Afghanistan, arguably one of the most impoverished countries in the world. Afghanistan is a country with, a, with little infrastructure or economy, and after decades of war, famine, and isolation, there are no country clubs with polo leaves. The nicest hotel in town, the Intercontinental, would rate a star or two by US standards, and sadly suffered extensive damage after a rocket attack caused a fire to rip through the hotel. Most homes in Afghanistan were made of mud. The Ring Road, a two-lane asphalt paved road, Afghanistan's sole attempt at a superhighway, was constantly butchered by IEDs and rocket attacks whose targets, were me, were NATO forces or convoys carrying supplies to troops. Many times, we would visit villages where raw sewage ran through the streets. While visiting one village and taking big swigs of tea that was prepared by women who had drawn the water from the village well, we inquired about what the village needed. The village elder told us a new well, as their well was rancid. We felt that tea for a couple of days. In the middle of Kabul, we were often forced to ford a stream we had dubbed Shed Creek for obvious reasons. A village we often visit, visited had been named the Garbage Village because its inhabitants sorted of trash, looking for items of value to sell for scrap. Flies were thick on the piles of trash and the children who sorted it. Luxury in this village was a mud hut instead of a shack cobbled together with scraps. Yeah, I'm embarrassed to admit this is a selfie. Uh, but when asked what Afghanistan was like, I described it as the surface of the moon because it was that desolate. Five years later, it is still difficult <coughs> for me to remember that Afghanistan is a nation of people and not a place where I was deployed to fight a war. Again, the poverty in Afghanistan could be explained with a poor economy, poor infrastructure, war, and a host of other resources the country lacked. Poverty came into sharper focus for me when I returned home. None of the children in my, in my classroom were subjected to the turmoil of Afghanistan. When I returned to the classroom from my deployment, I doubled down on my efforts to assist those students of mine who lived in poverty, but I was only scratching the surface. Here in this country as a society, we see poverty as an issue in countries like Colombia or Afghanistan. We fail to see the poverty in our own communities. In the United States, we see poverty as an issue for local, state, and federal governments to take on. Poverty is an issue for social services. As a society, we define poverty to, be, to mean a lack of economic resources. And so we throw money and material resources at the problem, and it is true. In order for people to self-actualize, they need the basics taken care of, such as food, shelter, and safety. However, to be truly effective in dealing with poverty, it is important to understand that poverty is not just a lack of economic resources, but a lack of resources in general, such as emotional, mental, physical, and support, and support systems as defined by Ruby Payne. The house I stood in was right here in central New York. The minute Sam spoke to me and said, you came here just for me, was the minute I understood why poverty persisted in the United States. Poverty persists in the United States due to untreated and undiagnosed mental health concerns. Poverty persists because of unemployment, and underemployment. Poverty persists because families have experienced generations of poverty and cannot get a leg out. Poverty persists because a family of four with two full-time minimum wage earners falls in between the poverty line and the income that is needed to support them, denying them services they need. The minute Sam spoke to me and said, you came here just for me, was the minute my heart broke.
In this moment, I knew I had failed him miserably. Sam had no support systems. Sam had been a student of mine when he was in kindergarten. He came to school, not potty trained. Success for him was not learning sight words, but getting through the day without an accident. I knew he was impoverished. The boy was now in fifth grade, and as the boy moved through school, his behavior became more erratic. And when things got difficult for the boy, he would run home the two blocks from school, often in the middle of the day. As an administrative intern that year, I was sent to the house to bring him back to the school. This is how I found myself in Sam's home. The difference between the United States and places like Colombia and Afghanistan is that as a nation, we have services and places to support families in poverty, and I had failed to link this family to those services. Until someone invested the time and attention in this family, the cycle of poverty would continue. And anything else I did was just a band-aid for the problem. This was one of the biggest aha moments of my teaching career. The minute Sam said, you came here just for me, was the minute I understood that I had traveled all over the world to learn a lesson that was right in my backyard. Keep working harder. Millions of welfare are depending on you. I'm sure we have all seen a bumper sticker like this at one time or another. We may have all even nodded and agreed as we were behind this bumper sticker philosophy at a red light after a particularly hard day at work. We may even know someone we feel who is abusing the system. Bumper sticker philosophies are powerful because they sum up the thoughts of a movement in a sentence or less. People with this bumper sticker do want to end poverty. However, we have to overcome the attitude that all the ownership and responsibility falls on those in poverty. My bumper sticker would be, ending poverty begins with you. Each of you in this room has the ability to impact someone positively who is living in poverty. I am learning that lesson every day. Last year, I had the opportunity to take a new position as an assistant principal of a large elementary school in a rural area in central New York. And one of my biggest responsibilities, they don't tell you this when you take the job, is that as an assistant principal is student management. The words student management sound very cut and dry, black and white, clinical in a way. It sounds organized and fluid. In reality, student management is anything but. Student management is messy very messy, often a hot mess. It's messy because we are dealing with people and the job is really about building effective relationships. People that have lived through generations of poverty are not gonna take up counseling to address behavioral health issues just because their child's assistant principal said they should. They are going to approach counseling after that person that is struggling as a resource that is struggling that is suggesting it as a resource is someone they can confide in. I can tell a parent to report the sexual abuse that is occurring in the family, but she won't unless she has a support system that is going to help her pick up the pieces afterwards. Building relationships to help people out of poverty is hard and tedious work. It may require trips to local law enforcement offices and the counselor's office to be a physical sign of support. It may require home visits due to lack of transportation. The, the idea is to set the family, and particularly the children, up for long-term success. This is what I had failed to do for Sam. I think about Sam every day. My experience with Sam has changed my thinking and guides my approach to working with families. I wish I could tell you there was a happy ending for Sam. I've lost track of him and his family, but my goal is to support the Sams of my new school community. A large number of families in our school live in poverty, and it is easy to rattle off these statistics for you. The hard part is learning about each family, building a relationship, and gaining their trust. 
We do this, as I said, through phone calls, home visits, and most importantly, following through on our promises. We work with students and their families to find funds to pay for electric bills and glasses. We work with families who have suffered through trauma and tragedy. It is important to respect their experiences and treat them with care and genuine concern. It is about understanding and believing that a parent of a child in poverty would not choose this. This past spring, I was asked to be part of an intervention organized by a county, health, county mental health provider. And each person at the intervention represented a stakeholder in the individual's life. I represented the school the ch individual's children attended. And during the intervention, I told the woman that the school would do anything it needed to support her and her children. But our bottom line was that she needed to make sure that her kids attended school. I offered her several solutions to make this happen. The facilitator thanked the school for offering the suggestions. And through the woman's tears, she nodded her head and explained how grateful she was for the school's support and that we were the only school that she'd dealt with that had returned her phone calls, took the time to work with her, and came to her home. We had taken the time to build the relationships with her, and she trusted us and was more receptive to our support and guidance. So here we are at an intervention on poverty, so to speak, and I challenge you to go forth from this room and build relationships with people in poverty. If you're a business owner, connect yourself with agencies that work with the impoverished. Find a way for your business to build relationships with people in poverty. If you are active in a church or a community organization, make a connection with those in need. If you are a community leader, Look closely at your practices and reflect on how they impact a family in poverty. Better yet, talk to a family in poverty. As a community member, look for an opportunity to build a relationship, volunteer at a school, or a shelter, or a food pantry. Learn about what resources are out there so when, it, when the time is right, you can offer that support to someone in need. The answer to ending poverty is in this room. We are the resources that can fight poverty. We are poverty's bottom line. Thank you. Thanks, Josh.